Hello, my name is Sam Felton, and welcome to Expert Interviews here on Smash the Fat. With me today um, is an exceedingly funny man um, who I met in Edinburgh up at Lateral Health, um, and he wrote a book called The Meat Fix, which he was talking about, and had a hilarious 30-minute talk on it. It is novelist and author of The Meat Fix, John Nicholson. How are you doing, John? Hey Sam, I'm doing good, thanks man. That was a fantastic introduction, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's very, very confident and you know, I, I try to be as flamboyant as I can. Um, yeah. I, I, I'll try and use as many um, uh, as many different words as I can as I am with uh, an actual professional writer. <laughs> <laughs> so we can at least make it somewhat interesting. And that's kind of what, what I actually got from, uh, from your talk, because um, um, kind of converse to, to most people, when I was up at Lateral Health in Edinburgh a couple of weeks ago, um, I had a PowerPoint presentation and things like this, um, and you know, um, I, that's how I kind of, you know, control where it's going, but you manage to talk for half an hour, and it's almost like it's stand-up comedy, what you do, um, and for people that haven't seen this book before or heard of it, let me bring that in there, um, it's called The Me Fix. Um, how a lifetime of healthy eating nearly killed me, um, and it's really about kind of your story of going from vegetarian for almost 20 years, I think it was, to becoming an omnivore, basically. Um, and uh, yeah, you managed to kind of, you know, come across as a very uh, realistic type of person, along with some proper um, time. A uh, tea side kind of humour, as well. Yeah. yeah, well, that's kind of what I do. Is that I'm, um, you know, like unlike yourself, I'm not a kind of uh, diet and food kind of guru. I just had this massive experience in my life. I was a, a vegetarian for 26 years, and I was a vegan, in fact, for most of that time. And um, and then I was for most of that time I was massively ill. I had chronic IBS amongst many other debilitating. Dis uh, uh, conditions, and um, and then when I started eating what you might consider a paleo diet, um, overnight it all got better, and I turned into the fabulously throbbingly healthy 53-year-old you see in front of you today. So when obviously as a writer, you know I write for a living. I mostly write fiction, but I write about football as well. That's how I got my name is writing about football. My 2010 book, um, We Ate All the Pies, which isn't about food, ironically enough, but about the culture of football. That made the uh, long list for the William Hill Sports Book of the Year that year, which just means I'm dead good. And um, so I thought, well, what I'm going to do is uh, I'll have to write about it because um, I'm a great believer in uh, Kerouac said, um, all life is capital, which just means that all you've got uh, as a writer is what you can draw on right with yourself. So I thought I'd just simply gone with some massive change of diet and of self-identity and of lifestyle. So I put the meat fix about it and, um, and basically wrote about what my life was like before and after and then subsequently what I'd learned um, from research about why I, I had been ill and, um, and why I got better. And then that uh, information really shocked me because it turned out <laughs> I've been lied to all these years uh, by uh, governments and by uh, doctors and uh, by other idiots who live behind plywood doors. And it's just, it amazed me and shocked me. So that's why I wrote The Meat Fix. And then obviously we hooked up uh, together at the Lateral Health thing because um, I was just saying to you when, actually, when we were there, the weird thing about this is that when you're in that environment, in a paleo or low carb environment, everybody kind of agrees, you know, to one degree or another mm -hmm. about things that we all feel like really mainstream. But as soon as we leave there, we feel like the weird, freaky people. Which traditionally, life I don't mind. But when it comes to healthy eating, it feels like, well, just eating basic food, that shouldn't be regarded as faddish or weird, should it? So anyway, yeah, the meat picks, that's what it's all about. Yeah, um, and it, it does feel exactly like that. Kind of when you are having conversations with people like yourself and I, um, and people within kind of the real food community, we're like, yeah, yeah, sure, that kind of completely makes sense. And you know, I've seen this, this, and this. Um, and then, yeah, as you go outside of of this kind of social bubble, then it it's the complete opposite. And as your subtitle suggests in the meat phase, you know, a lifetime of healthy eating did nearly kill you. And kind of just to quote the book quickly, um, you said, uh, we've been taken away from a down-to-earth, sensible, sane view of what is wholesome food and replaced it with a hysterical, paranoid, downright sick attitude 
a sick attitude which the medical and gov governmental establishment have colluded on and continue to encourage with a mixture of rigid dogma, ignorance, and guesswork, all the while under the influence of vested interest lobbying. I think kind of that paragraph there kind of sums the past 30 years up. Um, so kind of, you know, first off, how did you exactly you kind of get into the vegetarian, vegan lifestyle? Well, this was in 1984, and in 1984 I was, um, uh, I was about 23, and I was a very hairy man uh, with a beard and long <laughs> hair, and uh, I listened to The Grateful Dead, and I just really um, took a lot of mushrooms and smoked up, so I was a kind of hippie, and of course uh, part of the hippie lifestyle is definitely communing with the godhead violentals, and um, uh, so I kind of did that, so I quit meat because I kind of thought, let's not be beastly to the animals. Um, and you know, even now, as a, as, a, as an avowedly um, flesh eater, I do appreciate that vegetarians have a, you know, a kind of um, a good spirit. You know, because it's mm. not like people are vegetarians out of a sense of kind of like bloody mindedness. I think it's just people want to do the right thing. Yeah, That's yeah. what I wanted to do. I wanted to do the right thing and live a kind of natural life and um, live a live a kind of spiritual life too. So I mean, that was part of all that hippie thing. But of course, around that time. Um, the government um, uh, advice on healthy eating was changing from basing a diet on fat and protein, basing a diet on carbohydrates. Which obviously, I, I mean, this is only something I really learned about in retrospect. Um, but consequently, becoming a vegetarian in '84, within a year or two, it was being really touted as a much healthier way to live. That the old kind of meat and fat-based way of living was like going. It was being regarded as that'll kill you. And the way that all the kind of lentils and endless amounts of vegetable matter was like, no, that's the way you want to go. So I kind of had a double endorsement, both in terms of my kind of per private culture, my <coughs> excuse me, personal culture, but also in terms of what the dietary advice was. So it felt like a win-win. And then by the time you got to mad cow disease and all of that, it felt like I was I was like a superior being because <laughs> blood had not passed my lips, and uh, here was everybody else going crazy due to mad cow disease. And I was just suffering from chronic IBS, which is much better than dying. You know? Of course, yeah. yeah. Well, and as, as you kind of said, um, kind of almost having um, it coming out of, and sorry to all the listeners and viewers, coming out of both ends. Oh, yes. Yeah, uh, well, I always say, when people say, well, what do you suffer from? Because IBS is um, a different symptom for, um, you know, it's kind of a catch all term for lots of different symptoms. And I always say that everything I put in uh, the top end came out the back end very fast, and it just would, nothing would stay in me ever. And I would—I was cursed by it. I mean, I put in the in the meat fix uh, an incident where um, we were in uh, Chicago, and I was walking past the Chicago Institute of Art, as you do when you're a sophisticated hippie, and uh, I, I got took with a gripe. Now everybody who has IBS knows what this is like. It's sudden. It's like a spasm in your gut. And because you have them all the time, I mean, you have them most days, and it essentially means there's a large um, bomb going to go off in you quite soon, and you, and basically everybody, including yourself, is going to suffer. So I had to find a, a facility with which to um, to to uh, to get rid of the kind of effluent buildup, and uh, I ran into the Chicago Institute of Art and had to argue my way past lots of enormous American security guards trying to pretend to be Hugh Grant. I always find out being who Hugh Grant in America is very useful. People, people kind of think all Englishmen are kind of. If you don't speak like Hugh Grant or Prince Charles or Mick Jagger, they don't think you're English. Yeah, no, a northeastern accent is kind of, you know, just something that they wouldn't have heard. <laughs> and, and, and unless no, but, perhaps they've they, they've seen um, Full Monty or something like that. Yeah. That's right. Now they thought I was Dutch uh, or Australian. Uh, and it's no point in saying you're from the northeast of England because that doesn't mean anything to them. Because they think um, they think England is an island off of Africa somewhere. It doesn't mean anything to them. Anyway, so I went out and you know, and I'm running for the toilets in there. And I thought that that was just such a typical. When I was writing it, I was it was just such a typical incident of how inconvenient and, and you know upsetting it is really. I mean, I make light of it, but it's no fun. And that was just my life for 17 years to a greater or lesser degree. I mean, towards, towards the end of it. I was um, I was in a strange position of uh, being 15 stone. So, like at the moment, as you look at me, I'm at 11, 13, mm -hmm. and that, then I was I was bloated up. I mean, I was a, I had a massive head on me. I don't know why. I think most of the weight went on my head for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's called carp face, actually. So, <laughs> some people call it carp face, like the, the kind of like the the fat. <laughs> 
Well, I had carp face. I, I was poster boy for carp face, yeah. If I'd known, I could have got work as, as a poster boy for carp face. Look at my face, it's full of carbohydrate. Um, <laughs> because actually, when you're a vegetarian, and even more so when you're a vegan, everything you eat is carbohydrates. I mean, everything, you know. It's like my body was being experimented on by the healthy eating lobby. And it failed, man. It really failed. Uh, because obviously, you know, you're eating a lot of vegetables. Well, you know, some rice and brown rice and brown everything. Everything's brown, man. Yeah, if it was brown, you put it in your face. And, um, you know, like eventually I ended up, you know, like a, a clinically obese. And yet I could barely keep any food inside of me because of the IBS. So quite how all of this happened, I was a, a complete mystery to me at the time. And it wasn't until I sat down. Uh, one day, because my, I should say that um, my partner Dawn, who I live with, and we've lived together like for 34 years now, so we've been through this whole journey together, and she was, you know, with exactly the same diet, and of course she got sick too, she didn't get IBS, she got chronic depression, and, uh, and her thyroid was basically knackered, I think that's the technical term for it, yeah. and um, so it was her who suggested that the problem was not what we were eating so much as what we were not eating. And what we were not eating was good protein and animal fat. And she said, so she suggested that we start eating meat again. Well, when you've been a vegetarian or a vegan for 26 years, it's who you are. It's how everybody knows you. It's how you know yourself. So it's like a, not a, an easy thing to do. You know, it's not just like, oh, well, you know, you just do it flippantly. And I had to take myself to one side and have a really good word with myself and just say, I think we've got to do this now. And my other, more slightly conniving self said, all right, but we just won't tell anybody. And uh, so I could pretend to be a vegetarian while consuming lots of delicious meat so I wouldn't lose face. And, um, of course, once I certainly, as soon as I did eat, uh, stopped eating uh, carbohydrates in the form of wheat and potatoes and all the other high-load carbs and just started eating meat and vegetables, green vegetables, and, um, and butter, and lard, all of those symptoms that I had stopped. They just didn't come back. I mean, the day I started eating meat, they would stopped. They just nothing. I was just like normal again. And the weight started to come off, and I got a lot healthier and fitter, put on loads of muscle. You know, basically, it affected everything. I mean, absolutely every aspect of my life. Even my moods changed. I went from being quite um, um, what well, I used to be a bit teary at things, you know, like I could cry at a movie, I could cry at a guitar solo, which is a particularly um, uh, uh, what's that's, the like, that's like a connoisseur of crying. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, basically, I could cry at anything, me, you know. And um, uh, like now, I don't cry now. I'm just a hard bastard. I can't cry at anything. No, <laughs> I've lost all yeah. the human race. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's uh, essentially what it did, of course, now I understand what it happens, it took all the glucose out of my blood, so my, my emotions were flying up and down as much as they once did. And, um, and so I just felt more stable and um, more calm, and just easy, you know, it was a lot easier to work, and a lot easier just to get through life, really. And, it, and I, I just understood so much through this lens of change of diet, about how I'd been and what had made me ill. And that's why I had to write about it, because I thought, you know, like as I say, I was like a kind of guinea pig for this healthy eating. Because, like, I was so healthy, man. I mean, when I used to go to doctors, they would go, all right, well, we'll, we'll, put the, we'll send you to the nutritionist, right? And the nutritionist was someone who was fresh out of college who would just read a book. I knew nothing at all, really. You know, and I used to stand there and they'd go, right, so I'd, you know, I'd, I'd give them the food diary and it'd be like, yeah, uh, to do brown rice, lentils, beans, 13 vegetables, 5 fruits. Go on then, darling, what do you think of that? And you look at it and go, oh, there's quite a lot of calories in nuts. And you think... I oh, really have that's, that's the problem. Yeah, yeah. That, is that all you've got, man? You know, and, and I quickly realised that they didn't know what the hell they were talking about. And doctors didn't know what the hell they were talking about. And in my in the meat fix, and in all the, the talks that I do, I'm scathing of doctors. Because I find, in my experience, they are fantastic if you go walk into the surgery and something enormous and purple is hanging out of your trousers and you need it fixed. They'll go, why is this massive and swollen, doctor? And they'll go, yeah, yeah, you've splashed your wronger there. We'll, we'll, we'll put a splint on that. <laughs> but if you walk in and go, look, man, I'm mentally, I'm disturbed, I'm foggy-headed, I'm putting on weight, and I, I don't know what's going on, they don't know. They just don't know. And I think they should know. Or, perhaps more understandably, they should just tell us that they don't know. I don't mind if they don't know, but don't pretend you do know when you don't. And that was always my experience with doctors. 
So, um, yeah, so like I, when I started to analyse it all as to why I'd got better and why I'd been ill, all the answers from all the people that you interview and all the people that you talk about and everybody that we all know in the low-carb community, in the paleo community, they had all been saying this. Everything they said explained it. And I thought, well, I, if I can't write about this, but it's such a profound change, then I'm not a writer by name at all. So that's how it all came about. It is. It's, uh, it's kind of uh, a, a crazy situation that we've been put in in the past 30 years. As you say, the 80s was kind of like the height of the low-fat message. And yeah. that kind of is where it really started to take off. Um, and uh, as you kind of say, you were following that advice almost to the letter. And uh, you, you would have got a gold, so you got a gold star in the doctor's surgery for that. Um, and that, that was kind of along with your um, your cholesterol uh, test as well. well. That was the opposite, sorry, with your cholesterol test as well. What was going on then? Yeah, that was fantastic. I had lots of fun with cholesterol tests because obviously I was eating no cholesterol at all. And um, uh, yet as a vegan, in 2001 I was tested with a cholesterol level of 9.2, which at the time was the highest the person who took it had ever seen. And they were a little bit puzzled by all of this, given that I had such a healthy lifestyle. Like everybody said, that, oh, John, you're so healthy. This is fantastic. All the boxes have been ticked. I said, all right, then, well, why am I sick? And, uh, and they didn't really know. But they said, we have a pill. It's called a statin. And the game said, you've got to take this for the rest of your life. I said, oh, that doesn't sound much fun. I said, well, yeah, but you know, it won't cure you of anything, but it'll definitely stop you dying of a heart attack. Well, I stopped taking that after about three years, and uh, I'm still here, and I ain't died yet, and I ain't planning on dying yet. And I don't believe this. I, I, I'm a massive anti-statin guy, as you know, as most of us are, really, in, in most uh, circumstances. And, of course, um, now, when I went to, um, after uh, three years of a high-fat diet, and um, basically of an unhealthy diet, um, I went to get my cholesterol checked again, and it was five. Now, it was five on a high cholesterol diet. I know why that is. You know why that is, right? And everybody who can look it up as to why that happens, we're going to go into it now. But the doctors, they don't know, man. They're, they think it's voodoo, right? Yeah. They, not even that. They think I've cheated. I don't know who think I've got some rabbit blood or something. I don't know. But they're like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, maybe they should analyse it. Go, so, Mr. Nicholson, you appear to be a 13-year-old child. But no, it's not that. It was just the fact that I'd changed my diet. And they hated it. They hated the fact that I'd gone against them and that I'd been proved right. I like being right a lot in life. Um, not because it's kind of like I'm, I'm massively arrogant about it, but it's just that I like to... I'm a bit of an ornery sort. I think a lot of writers are like this. You know, we kind of mm. tend to take contradictory positions to the mainstream because it's where it's often quite interesting to do that. And it's quite a kind of, um, you, you kind of search for alternative views of things. And I, th I suspected this would happen when I had the, the, the cholesterol test. I must say, uh, as an addendum to this, I don't believe that cholesterol is, is massively important anyway. So it's not like I'm healthier because I've got lower cholesterol. I don't believe that at all. But I just think it's interesting that it was altered by my diet so massively. And of course, I now know that my body wasn't inflamed from all of the glucose, from all of the carbohydrate, that I'm basically, I'm a healthy guy now. So my cholesterol is whatever it was on that particular day. But the reason, of course, it's dropped as well, because my liver doesn't have to make all the cholesterol, and you know, because I'm just eating it. And, you know, we all, I learned that. And I, I, the thing is, I'm not a clever guy. I don't know why doctors don't know this. But they don't know it. So, you know, we have to tell them. It is. It's incredibly bizarre. We come across as kind of, as you say, the, the, the voodoo uh, kind of people that are trying to uh, bring up these uh, crazy notions that, you know, eating um, more cholesterol and saturated fat is actually kind of going to actually normalise um, blood cholesterol levels and carbohydrates are the thing that actually kind of regulate the amount of fat that's either on your body or in your blood as well. Um, and uh, one thing that you kind of go into in in the book as well is about how, how your grandparents ate. Um, so kind of how how did they kind of eat and how um, how did you kind of relate that? Yeah, well, when, when I started to write the book, I went back uh, to look at how my uh, grandparents were born at the turn of the 20th century. 
and the, what they're, how they lived and what their attitude to food was. Now, my grandma was a kind of wizened old Yorkshire woman from a pit village, and she was kind of um, professionally miserable, or, or, or Yorkshire as it's known. Yeah. And um, essentially, her attitude to life was, um, get it bloody yet. Right, that was all she said. Get it bloody yet. That's all I can hear in my head now. Now, so she would put like great piles of vegetables and fatty meat on your plate and sl slather it with gravy. Get it bloody yet. And um, I suddenly realised, really, because I grew up kind of thinking she was a bit of a miserable old bag. But actually, I realised that she knew exactly what suited um, her and her generation and her her generation's life because um, because they'd grown up with a uh, with a probably really without having enough food. So um, that was the only thing they kind of worried about. They knew that the potatoes and bread to fuel, to give them energy, to fuel a very physical life. My granddad was a, a, a pit worker. He worked three miles underground in the West Yorkshire coal field, hacking coal out with a pickaxe. So you know they actually consumed when it was looked in, uh, when research was done into the the diet of people around that time. They consumed about four thousand calories a day. You never saw an ounce of fat on any of them. Mm -hmm. And they knew that fat, like you should, my grandma always used to say, eat your fat on the chop, it's the best bit. Now, of course, these days in the kind of paranoid, oh my God, your 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 arteries are like a sink which will block up with uh, like with fat if you eat a uh, chop, you know, this is kind of widely disregarded. But my grandma knew that you got energy from fat, She uh, and, and she would hammer it into you time and time again. You know, eat your fat all the time, eat the fat, you had fat on meat, you know, fatty meat was considered good. And interestingly, even in the 60s, when my mother, in a kind of socially aspirational way that was around in the 60s and early 70s, would start to buy margarine, because margarine was... Uh, processed and made, and things that were made in a factory were looked upon, especially by the working class, as a little bit more qualityful. Shop bought was always better than home, you see. So my mum would start buying uh, blue band margarine, which is quite possibly the most toxic thing I've ever put inside me. And, uh, and my grand would say, I'm not bloody eating that, it's made in a bloody factory, I'm not eating out made in a factory. I wish I wish I was a factory now. Yeah, absolutely, because um, it is. It's it's these fake foods that are made in factories that um, the NHS and BDA are kind of pushing uh, that are actually, you know, making us fatter and sicker. Yes, and it's um, it, you know, it was a philosophy that Grandma knew perfectly well, and I, I thought, who the hell have I been to get away from this? All of these generations of knowledge that are grown up. You know, they didn't need people on the TV and didn't need uh, to tell them. They didn't need to have diet books to tell them. They knew from their personal experience what they needed to operate well. So I, I suddenly realised, like, you know, this is when I started to understand about ancestral eating, you know, obviously going back um, further with paleo and everything, but that this understanding, this innate listening to your body, seeing what it needs and providing it what it needs was something that we used to intrinsically know but we have lost, you know, we've lost through, uh, you know, for lots and lots of different complex reasons. And obviously in my case, you know, because I'd embraced this alternative culture where um, not eating meat was considered to be a kind of cool thing to do and, and like a more spiritual and even a healthy thing to do. But but in rejecting that, you know, that, that wisdom of the ages, I made myself chronically ill. And now, and I, you know, I am just... I'm just an, like, one small example of how this happened. I happen to have a live a, an extreme kind of diet and lifestyle compared to most people, but it is one that everybody, even now to this day, are being pushed to adopt. And that's why I'm quite evangelical about it now, because I just feel as though, you know, it's not like what me and you are talking about here isn't complicated or difficult. It's, in fact, it's the absolute opposite of that. It's just so simple. You know, and it, yet we're being dragged so far away from it all for so long that a lot of us are struggling to just sort of get on board with it. I mean, that's why the things that you do are so important, you know? That's fantastic, John. I, I hope so. I, mean, I hope sort of, you know, we, we can sort of simplify this sort of thing for people. Um, so what, what, what does your daily diet kind of look like? Well, it's kind of food on a plate. That's what it looks like. What? That's, that's crazy. It's you're, crazy. A, you're a fanatic. <laughs> crazy man. <laughs> well, all it is really a typical breakfast: um, wild salmon, scrambled eggs, maybe some spinach. Um, lunch will be uh, liver um, and greens, 
um, and uh, I'll, I'll for evening meals I would be eating chicken, roast chicken. Um, I tell you what, a really great thing um, that I'm really enjoying a lot at the moment is um, venison. Just totally into venison. I have lots of that as well. I cook stews. I cook the food that my grandma used to cook me. You know, I'll fry a chop in some lard. And, you know, and, I, and I, I have some carbohydrate. You know, I occasionally eat a bit of potato, a little bit of rice occasionally. Um, but I, it's the thing I'd like to always try to get across is that this isn't like a deprivation thing. It's not like, oh my god, I must have all grit piles of flowery, tasteless food again. It isn't that. Oh, how I look at it is I'm just eating food which is full of nutrition. That's all I'm doing. And it's easy. I just don't find, I don't know why, and, you know, I've had other friends who've seen the change in me because, because I, I did change so radically physically. Yeah. And they've said, wow, I'm going to have a go at that. And my, my pal Alan, like, he's lost like three stone on the, just the same regime. Wow. You know, and he's gone from being a big heavy lad to being slim again. And it just works. It's not because we're like selling a kind of weird, some weird shit, you know, like a cabbage soup diet or a... It's not, man. This is how people used to eat. That's all, you know. Yeah, it's it's kind of like um, it's it's been um kind of the it's been uh, tried and tested. Sorry, yeah. uh, for for generations, this style of eating. Um, yet we we come across as, as these fanatics and extremists at the moment. Anyway, but we're we're basically sort of saying, you know, as he said before, carbohydrates. You know, they they use that for their energy, for like you know, physical um, physical activity, whether it be in their work or in their outside of their work and exercise. But you know, if you're not going to be doing any of that, then the carbohydrates is the thing that you just have a lot less of. You know? Yeah, um, not basically at all. It was so. And so it's not complicated at all. And as I said, my, the title of that talk that I did at the Lateral Health thing was Unhealthy is the New Healthy, because I'm a great believer in having a takeaway point from lots of things, and um, you know, to try and just have a shortcut to understand what it is that, that all the reading and everything uh, that you've done um, is the point it's making. And I suddenly realized that really, with a couple of caveats, <clears throat> If it's been recommended to you as healthy, don't eat it. Don't eat it, man. It'll kill you. But if it's been recommended as unhealthy, cram it in, baby. Cram it in. Because, you know, that's the stuff you want. Um, there are only exceptions to this. is sugar, really. And, um, and even that, you know, really, I just think, I mean, the best example I have of it, and we were talking about this just before, is um, uh, I suddenly realised, because as a kind of fruit juice drinker, as a, as a vegetarian vegan, you think, oh man, I'm drinking so much fruit juice, it's fantastic because like fruit's great for you, man, so like having a lot of it's even better for you, I'm going to live forever. And uh, then I suddenly realised that I'm like one glass, I'm drinking like, the juice of seven oranges. Well, how on earth is my body supposed to deal with that? He ain't set up for that, man. You know, it's crazy. And I suddenly realised, yeah, that's it in a nutshell. We've been told to do something that's, we've been sold something that is really extreme and weird, and we've been sold it like it's it's moderate. And it's not moderate, it's really extreme. And it's so ironic that we're the ones who are called fad diets, and the mainstream ones are called, oh yes, we're very moderate, you know, we believe in moderation in all things. I don't believe in moderation in all things, I just believe in doing the right thing. Screw moderation. Like, what about, like, oh, you just have a little bit of cyanide in your food. That's just a moderate bit. I don't want a lot. Well, screw yeah, that. Just a nickel bit. A little bit. Just a it's grain. Of, yeah, it won't do any harm. No, I mean, it's just, it, but that's it, isn't it? You know, it's, I, I hate the way the parameters of the debate have been defined by those with the most money and the most vested interest in it, which is largely the pharmaceutical industry, the soya industry, the wheat industry, and the uh, non vegetable shortening fats industry. And all those people have got so much money invested in it that they don't want us just to say, hey, you know what, you could just eat natural stuff that's not being made in a factory by somebody wearing a hairnet. No, that's all. Is it so hard? It's not so hard. That's it. Real, real, real food is where it's at. Um, and, you know, if you're wanting to lose a little bit more weight, just reduce the amount of carbohydrates that you're eating, basically. Um, which, which is kind of the advice that we've always had. Um, as you as you put there and put in the meat fix 
um, which is a fantastic book. I recommend everybody going to get it. It's, it's kind of very rare to have somebody uh, with actual uh, humour and comedic capabilities as well in the nutrition and health world. So thank you very much, John, for that. Uh, people can grab The Meat Fix on Amazon. Uh, if you're in the UK, uh, grab it uh, at smashthefat.com forward slash TMF. UK and if you're in the US, make sure you go to smashthefact.com forward slash TMFUS, then that'll take you through to Amazon and also it'll give us a little bit of coal on the fire to support the show. Um, and then also, as you said there, John, you're a, a professional uh, novelist as well, um, and today you actually released the seventh, the seventh in your Nick Goimer series. As well, so do you just want to kind of talk about that just briefly. Yeah, well, uh, Nick Geimer is um, is kind of based on me really, and is uh, is a kind of guy. He's a football writer in Teesside, and he, lots of uh, things happen to him and problems he has to solve. Of course, for fans of low fat carb, uh, the low carb. I'll start again. <laughs> for Sorry. fans of low carb eating, he is in fact a low carb. Guy, so it's like one of the few protagonists I think in modern literature who, um, you know, he takes around boiled eggs and bits of ham with him because he doesn't want to eat chips. And I think that's brilliant, you see. So, like, you know, so you know, you can read the books. It's the great fiction. They're kind of like crime fiction, but uh, you can read that. But get recipe tips as well. I mean, what that's irresistible. What a great sell. That is absolutely beautiful, John. And that's that's the way that I want things to go in terms of you know having that within stories and things. It's fantastic to get it, get it across. And again, people can grab that on Amazon if they go to smashthepad.com forward slash NGS. That stands for Nick Geimer series NGS. Make sure that you check it out. Um, and thank you so much for your time today, John. Were there any other wise words? Um, with a little bit of added humour in there that you wanted to leave us with. Well, no, I'm, I'm just actually looking at my screen here. I appear to have disappeared into the you dark. You have disappeared over the past half an hour, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> it's, uh, it's OK. It's just that there's no light in here, and I'll just have to burn some furniture just to illuminate, because obviously, you know, as a kind of, as a paleo man, I don't I have electricity. I just, I just burn that. I've got, I like, I'll be burning a moose. And, uh, I'll set light to a moose, and uh, that'll illuminate the night. No, but I mean, thanks for all the great work you're doing, man, and uh, for giving me a chance to talk about it. And uh, you know, I hope everybody's you know has a good time and just just basically think about that unhealthy, healthy thing. Just everything, you know, look, look, put that through that lens, and you won't go far wrong. Beautiful, beautiful. There's only one more thing to do, John, and that's to hear a smash it out from John Nicholson. So on the count of three, I want you to shout "smash it out" to the camera. So one. Two, three, smash it out! Whee! There we go. I think that's the first northeastern accent that we've had on the show. Shouting, smash it out! And it it sounds great. So yeah. thank you, John, <laughs> for that. It's beautiful, mate. Um, and uh, again, people check out the meat fix at smashthefact.com forward slash TMF UK or TMF US, and check out uh, the Nick Gomez series on Amazon as well at smashthefact.com forward slash NGS, uh, where you can get recipe ideas as well as reading a great crime novel at the same time. Thanks again, John. I'll speak to you soon, mate. Take care, man.